Out in West Texas, there lives a street artist, an artist by the name of Pono. He was born and raised into ranching, but quickly got in with the wrong crowd. I'm talking skateboarders and street artists. And the rest is history. This collision of cultures created a unique artistic style known as Neo Southwest. He's part Texas, part Portland, and all odds, baby, on this episode of... Uh, so I'm here with Pono. He came all the way from Texas. And we're at this cool shop. So you're working on a mural inside this building? Yeah, I'm uh, painting for a, for a friend who's a toy maker, Humengo Toys. This is Matt Wicker. I always drive by this place and I'm like, this place has a bunch of dope art. Yeah, so I kind of want to make it like a tattoo sleeve. You know? Murals are like the tattoos of the city, right? Yeah. Like, There's like a difference between like the tags on my window uh -huh. and like actual like stuff that people throw up. Yeah, well that's the big question is who's the decider? Like someone has to just decide that it's good graffiti or bad graffiti. Honestly, True. All these murals are for so that people do not tag my building. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they are. They're Disclaimer. Really, like at the end of the day, they're Everybody. The um, over here, we're going to the other side of the building. Is that where you are based out of now? Is it Austin? I thought it was no, there. I'm in uh, closer to El Paso. I'm in Monahans. That's where I was born. And right now, they pretty much they're like strip mining the sand hills. All the ranches that I grew up working and stuff, they're all being strip mined for sand to be used for fracking. That sounds sad. Yeah, it's it's terrible. I thought about blowing up the sand plants. <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to go to prison for the rest of my life either. It does seem like a big undertaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so this is like the groundwork that you laid the other day for the wall. Yes, that's, that's the doodle grid. So the doodle grid is just for a reference point. It's like any other grid that people use in art. Like if you made just a regular grid with lines, with vertical and horizontal lines. Yeah. This is just like that, except it's, I think it's less stressful, it's more freeing. Seems less mathematical. Like you yeah. don't have to have a ruler. And it still works the same it. way though, it's like the reference point. Now it's like, oh the tip of this knife thing uh, is like the beginning of the elbow to the wrist, it's like the head of this bird, you know, you can map it out that way. So you superimpose like a design if you have a design. I was gonna say, so you, like the original sketch, do you have to have a small version of this grid over it that matches? Yes, since this is like for the toy maker, who this is, his studio is like, this is his wall, so he's like right in there. So it's gonna be like the toy maker, you know, the saw, some like nails in the backpack, and then like this like finished golden bird. Cool which I have yet to really design, so. <laughs> like many artists I've talked to, Pono creates his designs in a software called Procreate, so he can digitally superimpose his doodle grid over it for reference. So here, this is like, so this is the doodle grid. See, it's perfect grid system. Perfect. These are like the colors I'm gonna choose from. That's the paint that I've got right now. These are all like Montana black, I think. So you can like, so pretty much I can, that I, color yeah, and I can hold, match it? I can hold that color, match it, so that yellow, I know it's gonna be more like my gold. This one here, I'm probably gonna come in and like, like fill that. And this is based off of a previous painting, so I'm trying to like change it up enough. Like ideally I would just start off something totally new from scratch, but I'm so pressed for time that I'm like, you know, I've already got a, like a decent character this size. Oh, we're also gonna cut out up here. We're cutting out pieces of wood for the ears. So we're gonna put those up there. So you, you have a, like a few go-to animals. I see a lot of coyotes. Is this coyote kind of your main, your main jam? Uh, for now, yeah. This will work. Oh yeah, blue. Give me some blue. So this is how the doodle grid works. So like. I've got like a boot, my boot here, something like right here. Sure. To, it's probably a little lower, but somewhere over here. Sweeping kind of curves. Mm -hmm. So now I could probably just go in and just kind of go for it. 
You have to start with a couple proportional markers. Yeah. But then I'll like end up just kind of so going for it. You kind of have it in your head what you're trying to do. Yeah. So it's gonna be something in there for like the spur. Sweet. It seems like a lot of your art style is inspired by ancient art in a way. Like it feels like it's from another time. Yeah, uh, I mean, I hear that a lot, and I, I definitely see that those similarities. I don't know, I grew up in a ranching in the Southwest. I think, like, kind of there was, like, Western motifs that always just kind of, I guess, like, subconsciously stuck with me. And then it wasn't until I first moved up here to Portland in 2005 that I, I had a roommate who's a really good friend of mine named Sheldon Scully and he's an amazing artist. But uh, he is um, Haida Lakota native, and he introduced me to Formline, which is like basically what you see in, like, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Totem pole. Yeah, yeah, that kind of I, stuff. I, I think that uh, I, like a lot of the Formline stuff kind of like stayed with me. My style also comes from just like the cowboy kind of rough upbringing, yeah. you know? It has a... Southwest feel to it. Yeah. The more you progress, the more you become like a perfectionist. You're like, it's got to be better a little bit yeah. more every time. Your standards keep rising just a little bit. Yeah. And that's one thing also is like I try to like keep it loose too because you get to a point where it's not fun anymore. The thrill is gone. I'm no longer painting just because I like it. Exactly. So how do you hold on to that feeling? Um, you don't, no. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> it just keeps going, man. Uh, I think that, I think it's good to take breaks every now and then. It's like, because we're in the age of hustle and all that bullshit and like, I don't know, I guess I, I, I'm kind of not like one who like subscribes to like the idea of art as a commodity. For, I guess it's, it's more about the, the, the process. Than anything rather yeah. than the end result like the, the actual making the actual part of like creating I guess I guess I would say as far as like keeping holding on to like the passion of yeah. art keep your juices flowing. to keep the juices flowing it's uh, a daily practice is really is really awesome um, I used to draw like every day when I woke up mm -hmm. for at least an hour and uh, like a set time yeah it was yeah. just wake up drink coffee and draw and I haven't been doing that for, for a while now. And that's like a plan that I need to get, you know, I'm planning to get back into that. You know, I have other other interests too. Like I'm into yeah. the filmmaking, writing, those kinds of things. Yeah, you're probably just creative in a lot of different directions. Yeah, and it all kind of flows together, but it, it's like you gotta keep that the, the creative wheel turning. If you look at it, if you kind of like look at it as something that's not like going to be a finished piece of art, it's a lot easier to to lose that attachment to it being perfect or something. Like you, you just like you have fun. You're doodling, and that's where like all the new kind of creations come from. It's just yeah. where it's just you're just doodling. Aimless, no goal. Yeah, there's no like, you know, like this has to be something. You're kind of just exploring. You know? This is my life, you know. Uh, yeah. But um, I would prefer it. If it if I was like independently wealthy, you know? uh, yeah, and you could just because when I don't know when you attach the uh, the money to it, a lot of times it can detract from the, the process. Yeah, it might be less because you feel like it, and more because you have to. Yeah, and when it becomes a have to, then it, you start to like rebel against that. Or at least I do. Like I start to be like, well, fuck that. I'm not yeah. doing that. I will start and finish like five new pieces before I, I have like the commission that I got last year. 
done. Well, that's kind of the mysteries of creativity in a nutshell, is like certain settings allow for creativity to flow better. Yeah. What are we doing? We're going into Wicker Woodworks studio to uh, make some cuts. I already got this piece cut out. This will be the ear, the left ear. Uh, this will be the right ear. Cut out with the bandsaw. Check it out. Once you start feeling, um, yeah, stagnant or whatever, it's like, yeah, it's time to move on. This like character that I've kind of became like known as my style or whatever uh, has become like that cornerstone of like the thing that is stability for me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I can come back and do that, and I can do it in this this way, and you know, explore the different ways of like interpreting this character. Sure. And and the story behind the character actually is really just like it's a full. The, the word Pono is actually, a, it's a Hawaiian word. And um, I had some friends that, that live in Hawaii, on the big island in Hawaii. It was a thing that I started out just writing in drawings or paintings as a reminder of what, what it actually means, which is just like, it's basically a word for like righteousness and like kind of all the qualities of like, you know, honesty and respect. The Hawaiian friends of mine would call it like aesthetic dog that's Pono, or like those people are Pono, yeah. you know, it's a Pono thing, right? Yeah. And so, at the time is when I was like really struggling with like addiction or like, you know, alcohol, and I was like, well, I just need to like try to be more, like, you know, Pono, and if it doesn't resonate with me in that way, then it can't like, it can't cool. happen, you know? It's like an affirmation almost. Yeah, it's like a, a daily aff affirmation. So it's not to say like, I am Pono, <laughs> you know? It's like, remember Pono. Yeah. Does it matter? Does it not matter? If no one sees it, or if no one cares, Yeah. is there a point to still creating art? It's like, does it, if a tree falls yeah. in the woods, does anybody hear it? I mean, I have to imagine that's part of the excitement of murals, yeah. street art, public art. It is, you can tell, you're, like I tell myself that it doesn't matter, like I don't care if anybody sees it. And there's art that, you know, I make, that I think, I do believe that, uh, like I like to paint a lot of abandoned structures and mm -hmm. there's there's paintings that I've done in the places where like nobody, maybe one or two people have seen them. And it's, yeah. that's just like, that's just for me. From most creative people I've talked to, I feel like there is almost like a an itch or a craving where you have something that you need to express and it doesn't yeah. feel good if you don't express it like yeah. you have to to get some sort of like creative relief almost definitely and i think it's depressing when it doesn't happen it's almost like a sexual thing in a, in a way like uh in the release factor yeah the release factor <laughs> but sometimes i'm like i don't know why i'm like in a terrible mood and depressed and like not really into anything mm -hmm. and then it's like I make a, I do a drawing or I find something to paint on and you know do something quick and then I immediately feel like feel better. I feel like anytime I go out on a limb or something, uh, it's appreciated. Um, and sometimes when I do something that I'm just like really questionable, I'm like, ah, this thing sucks. And then people see it and they're like, that is incredible. I want it sold. I'm like, oh, awesome. Thank you for, you know, buying my groceries for the next month. That shit confuses me though. It kind of freaks me out if I think something's bad and someone else thinks it's good, then I'm like, oh man, do I have a, is my compass off yeah. for do what I have is good? Yeah. yeah. I like to call it the stinky cheese theory. Everybody develops their own taste, right? And um, yeah. so whenever I was a kid, I remember seeing commercials for blue cheese. And I didn't know what the hell blue cheese was. Um, and I was like, mom, I want some blue cheese dressing. She got like craft blue cheese from like the market down the street. And like, I didn't know what to expect. And I put it on my salad. And I was like, this is disgusting. Yeah. And I put it in like a super soaker and my buddy and I like shot each other with blue cheese water. And then later though, like now I like love Blue cheese, like I've been eating my whole life I now. Cheese, but I did not as a kid. Yeah, didn't as a kid, right? So um, I think that art, uh, in a way, is kind of like once once you get into that world, you know, maybe it was like the you know ranch 
dressing that got you in there, and then you start to develop a taste, and then you're like, I want the stinky cheese of art, and it's like the weird shit. I think of something, and I'm like, that would be cool to see, you know, on the scale. Yeah. And once it's done, like, I appreciate that, and move on. You know, I'm not looking for the, the applause or like whatever. Well, it sounds like you're doing it right. It sounds like you're doing it because you like it and you're doing things that you want to see. Yeah. It seems like how you you should do it. And sometimes that what I want to see happens to be the you know the same thing that somebody else wants to see. That's so when that nice. when that happens, then it's really cool. It works out for all of us. You know.